So one of the things that I normally like to talk about on my podcast, if you're listening for any number of years that I've been doing this podcast, is aging and what happens as we grow older and how to slow that down and letting the cat out of the bag, as you may know if you listened to me before, exercise is one of the best ways to maintain functionality as we grow older. Uh, About 50% of people over the age of 80 have a condition that many people have never even heard of before called sarcopenia, which is this loss of muscle mass and muscle power as we get older. So I want to continue with that conversation today by talking with Bruce Kelly. Bruce has been a personal trainer for GWIZ over 20 years. He's worked with athletes. We're over 40 now. Over 40. Oh, goodness. Okay. Over 40 years, I stand corrected. (laughs) You've been doing it, I think, longer than I have been. So uh, we want to talk about um, aging and exercise as we get older and and hopefully spur people on to maintain their physical function and have a better quality of life. So, Bruce, what can you add to this conversation? Take it away. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Joe. Um, One of my passions and actually... Quite a bit of my clientele now is of a certain age, and <laughs> whatever age we want to draw that at, whatever line that is, 50, 55, 60, whatever. I have several clients now in their 80s, actually, um, that are still training with me. So to me, uh, the old phrase, exercise is medicine, is no more true than it is with the older population. Um <laughs> There's a book out there by Kelly Sterrett and his wife called Built to Move. Uh, Kelly Sterrett is a big CrossFit guy, but also a doctor of physical therapy. And the essence of the book is that we are meant to move. And they have 10 guideline things that are kind of tests, if you will, baseline tests of your movement ability. And I think too soon old and too late wise in terms of people discovering the power of movement. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, you're absolutely right. And you said your oldest person you've worked with is 85 or so. My yeah. oldest, my oldest was my 104 year old grandmother. Oh, so. good job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and one of the things that I said to her repeatedly um, going towards the end is, you know, there's three things we got to do. We got to eat, we got to drink, we got to move. And Mm -hmm. uh, for older people, uh, again, the, the advanced age people, sometimes we lose the sensation for thirst. We don't get thirsty. Mm -hmm. And I saw that in my own grandmother. I had to keep repeating, you got to drink, got to drink water, tie a string around your finger, whatever. And you just took a drink there, whatever you got to do. Uh, and, and, and you got to eat. And as sometimes, again, as we get older, we're our, we, we don't eat as much, which contributes to that muscle loss. Mm -hmm. And as we get weaker, we get tireder, we do less. And when we do less, I, I always say that opens up a doorway to a bunch of other problems, uh, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, you know, hypertension, all kinds of conditions uh, manifest themselves when we don't move more. So um, I, I would agree 100% with that. It's, it's extremely important as we grow older, for all ages, but definitely as we get older. Yeah, I think even more. You can get away. There's a margin for error when you're younger both in terms of movement, but also in terms of recovering from episodes, um, you know, injuries, ni- you know, niggles, whatever you want to call them. Right. So, yeah, the ability and the capacity to be able to move. I also think that, quite frankly, in the medical slash healthcare community, we have sold the older population short. We have set the bar too low, in my opinion. Most of the research is on populations that aren't that active. And so we settle for the lowest common denominator. And part of my proselytizing or my uh, my new book that's coming out uh, is about this very fact that the idea is to provide a template for people that are willing, able, you know, physically able uh, to really push their training or push their movement to higher levels, not settle for things, improve their health span, improve the the life in their years, not just the years in their life. I think it's a, it's a, it's a good philosophy to have 
you know, I hate to use the the hackneyed expression that we have not a healthcare system, but a but a sick care system. But no, no question. No it, it question. does it does appear to be that way. I I often on my podcast and even in classes I teach, I often talk about my favorite clinical study where they took people in nursing homes who were, who were in wheelchairs, and for one month they gave them one exercise, the leg extension. They actually gave them heavy weights, eighty percent of the most weight they could lift only one wow. time. Wow. And in one month they became 174% stronger. Their walking speed increased by about 50%. They no longer needed canes and walkers anymore. And when they wrapped tape measures around their little thigh muscles, their little thigh muscles started to get bigger. They showed hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and so again, I, I, I say that I think all nursing homes, if they still call them nursing homes, they probably call them something else now, more <laughs> politically correct name. But I think all of these facilities should have a gym. I, oh, yeah. And they probably should have staff in there, qualified coaches, trainers, whatever, in there helping people that need the help. Um, I know my mom was at um, Plush Mill there in Wallingford for a while, and they had a nice gym. I don't know how much it was utilized, um, but they certainly had one. Um, again, uh, some, I get, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy or this vicious cycle of you become less active so you don't eat as well you don't hydrate as well then you get it just it compounds itself um yeah. and then it gets to the point where it's almost uh irredeemable or hard to come back from that so yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a very sad scenario especially in our country we're a growing old nation uh, we're not having babies like we used to anymore. And, uh, you know, nobody likes to talk about it, but, you know, you, you can, and, and I've said this before, and anybody who's listened to me before, you know I'm going to say it again, you can't insure a nation of sick, unhealthy people. No, um, the math doesn't work. Right. The math does not work. So the politicians will never say that, but they all want to talk about universal health care, which is a great thing if you can do it. But you got to do your part. I don't know why we, we don't have like ESPN doing, you know, TV shows on or episodes of like, you know, the presidential fitness test or anything like that. The closest mm -hmm. they get is the CrossFit games. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but I really want to see primetime TV commercials talking about what we're talking about right now and on billboards. I mean, I see celebrities talking about medications for diabetes and stuff because obviously they're getting paid back. Why aren't all those? Why isn't there any celebrity on primetime television taking out a you know, commercial airtime talking about the benefits of exercise yeah. or, or eating a salad once in a yeah. while? Yeah, um, no. That, it's it's again the, the the part of it is obviously the healthcare reimbursement slash insurance company system. So uh, insurance companies reimburse for those measures you talk about, you know, yeah. meds and uh, that type of stuff, yeah. uh, surgeries, etc. I mean, I tell my clients I had that one of my eighty year old clients was having some issues with his shoulder when he was in his 70s or whatever, and he kind of, oh, I think I'm going to get surgery. I said, Warren, hold off. That's your last resort. Your original equipment is always the best. And so long story short, I gave him some, and I'm not claiming, you know, I had the panacea, but the fact of the matter was we did some exercises. His shoulder got stronger. The pain went away, and he never had the surgery, and now it's 10 years down the road. So... Um, yeah. Do you, some people need surgery for, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but again, it's your last resort, not, um, top, not, not top of the priority list. So yeah. it's, it's unfortunate. You, you have used a word, a phrase that I have not heard of before, uh, at least not put together, ageless athleticism. Can you mm -hmm. talk more about what that is? Cause I've never heard of it, to be honest with you. Well, uh, I don't know if I can claim pride of authorship or not, but it's the title of my forthcoming book. And essentially, I think if you were to ask people, you know, honestly, what, you know, how do you want to move? What, what, I, what's your goal here in terms of your training, your uh, movement program, whatever? Most people would say in some way, I want to move or look or feel like an athlete. Um, you know, they might recall when they were younger and they moved better and more fluidly and all that stuff. So, um, and I think most people, if you ask them what they would like to look like, they would cite 
athletes, you know, whether it's a soccer player or a tennis player or whatever the case may be. So that being the case, then we got to orient our movement training or training, whatever you want to call it, towards that. And so to me, athleticism is, I saw this phrase many years ago, it was applied actually to Dorothy Hamill, the Olympic skating champion, to give you an idea how long ago it is. Mm. And it said, uh, grace is power perfected. Grace is power perfected. So when you watch a good athlete, a good mover, whatever, whether it's a dancer or Steph Curry or Mike Trout or whatever the case may be, Serena Williams in her prime, um, they do these things that seem impossible, but it seems effortless on their part. So mm -hmm. that is kind of the uh, personification of that phrase. Um, grace is power perfected. So one of the things, as you well know, I'm sure uh, that we lose physical qualities that we lose most quickly as we age is power, right. the ability to express force quickly. Right. And most people would say, well, that's the purview of athletes, mm -hmm. somewhat. But what do you think is key to fall prevention? If you can't get your foot, your hand or whatever down to brace yourself, then you're doing a face plant. And we know what happens when people fall, especially if they break hips, right. et cetera, et cetera. It's a long or not so long, slippery slope. Right. Um, so that's one of the examples of things in a lot of training programs with older people, especially don't include any sort of power training. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something that is, sorely missing there are ways to do it they have wonderful inventions called medicine balls for example that virtually everybody can use in some fashion right. and everybody has fast twitch muscle fibers in there <laughs> whether they've been used in a while and how activated they've been lately is another matter right but that's the idea of that type of training is and i again i train my 80 year olds Throw medicine balls. So, um, again, and they love it. They love it. It's like play. It plays a four-letter word with most adults. Right. And why is that the case? Who wrote that? Right. <laughs> Where was that rule written? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I did something similar. I was covering a friend's clients not too long ago when he was on vacation. And, I, and one of these individuals was 94 years old. And I did something similar. I didn't have a medicine ball, but I had one of those, you know, stability balls. And mm -hmm. kind of bounced it on the on the floor. And she caught it. And she threw it back to me. And again, play the game. If it's if it's right. fun, people will keep doing it. Yes. Um, and so it was hand-eye coordination, which is really important as we get older as well. Mm. Um, spatial awareness. Um, so yeah, and obviously I'm sure you're not, you know, throwing 50 pound medicine balls at these 85. No, 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 no. I, you know, that's the thing. I, a two or a three pound medicine ball, less than five pounds is fine. And again, you gotta, I mean, I am a gadget guy, so I have a trunk full of medicine balls, but, uh, the appropriate tool for the task is important. And, um, like I have some husband and wives that train together and they'll have a catch with the medicine ball. So they're working on their power, but also, as you said, on hand-eye and breaking, deceleration of the ball when it's coming in, all those qualities that are frequently lost as we get older if we don't do something mm -hmm. to snap them back to attention. What are some things besides medicine balls people can do now if they're hearing this for the first time and they're wondering, hey, this sounds pretty good. Uh, I haven't exercised in 20 years. How do I how do I get started to you know improve these fast twitch fibers, improve my overall health, my strength, mm -hmm. uh, and even my athleticism? What would you suggest for that individual? Well, I, I know this is an old caveat, but go to your doc first, please. Um, especially guys. I always say this because guys are the most stubborn. They think they know it all. You know, I've been in it. Oh, I know it. Yeah. Um, but make sure, you know, if you haven't exercised in a while, then make sure you get a clean bill of health, that everything is in order, that your blood pressure is good. And uh, I would assume you would know whether you have any orthopedic issues or not. Yeah. Um, 
And then once that's done, then things like basic fundamental movement patterns, as you well know, you know, every program, in my opinion, should have a squatting pattern in it, should have a hip hinging pattern in it, a push and a pull, and there's vertical and horizontal versions of those, a gait of some sort. So gait can be everything from walking to running or trying to emulate Usain Bolt. Um, so um, those things, and then obviously trunk or core exercises. Um, yeah. so that opens a wide variety of possibilities and my opinion, both in the way I train and I know this is not everybody's cup of tea. I'm big on, um, free weights, body weight, etc. I'm not a big machine guy. I've trained lots of people, people with Parkinson's and other neurological disorders, as well as. I have now a client who's a amputee, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm not using machines with him. They're, it's all free weight bands and things like that, medicine balls, kettlebells, et cetera. Um, sure. So um, partly it's because I'm doing my own thing out of my garage or at their house or wherever, right. and I don't have the room or the budget for that, but also from a functional sense i don't understand if you're sitting if sitting is a problem for most people too much sitting why would you go to the gym and then sit on a series of machines to do your strength training and furthermore why would you pay somebody to lead you through those machines when if you can read look at the placards on there they have pretty good descriptions of what the exercise is right uh, i don't get it but yeah, it's I, I see where you're where you're coming from. I, I, I know there's benefits to machines as you do. It's just, and, and free weights do have and, and body weight has their advantages. You know, you, you triggered a memory when you were talking about this for a second ago because you know <laughs> what, what people may not know is we used to work together about twenty or so twenty twenty yeah, over twenty years ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Back at this uh, really uh, high back then high tech hospital. It thing. was. It was. It was. It was. Uh, it was one of the top rated. Lady Art. Health clubs in the whole country it was, I think yep. it was ranked number seventy five. Yeah, top one hundred. But I always remember, as you know, I ran a lot of these programs for people who were older and had health problems, and and I always remember this woman uh, who came up to me uh, many years ago, and and when I was working there, and she said, she said to me, Joe, how come I can do the leg press machine with about I don't know, I think she said about one hundred and fifty five, hundred and seventy mm. pounds, and she was about eighty five years old. And she said, but I slipped in the mall last weekend and I couldn't get up. Isn't the leg press the same thing as getting off the floor? Mm. No, it's no. not. Yeah. And it, it took about two weeks to retrain her to get her to remember, not only remember, but also you know, move those muscles in a functional capacity so she could get off the floor. I remember going into one of the aerobics rooms and getting like 20 or 30 of these, uh, those little robot, uh, uh, yoga mats and stacking mm -hmm. them on top of each other. Mm -hmm. You know, and every uh, every couple of days, I removed one or two, and she was lower and lower and lower, and you know, got her on the floor. And you know, after a couple of weeks, you know, she was getting up and down off the floor again. So, um, you know, that yeah, there's that Brazilian physician that's done tons of research on the simple get down and get up exercise, which you know made the national news. You know, how effectively and efficiently can you, from standing, get down to the floor and back up? And the more contact points right. you make in order to get back to your feet from the ground after going down from standing yeah. is a barometer of your mortality. Right. Um, and as we get older, we spend less and less time down on the ground. Right. Kids, on the other hand, are there all the time. Yeah. And they're falling, they're running, they're jumping, they're rolling around, they get up and off the ground. So a great barometer of somebody's Functional fitness, if you will, that's an overused phrase, is how well can they get up off the ground? And to your point about your client, um, that's they sell devices so that you can notify the, the medical people to come and get you when you can't get up off the ground. So, right. yeah. And, and 
you know, capitalism is great, but I, and capitalism, I think, is also enabling some of this. Uh, if you go into some furniture stores, you even see chairs that will lift you up out of a seated position. Mm. And, and I know there are people who will benefit from this, but I keep saying to myself, most people just would benefit more from some physical activity, strengthen those lower body trunk muscles. And, mm. uh, and, and you would need that because, you know, once you fall, once you can't get off the floor, you can't take care of yourself and into the nursing home you're going. And they don't want you to move in a nursing home because then you're a fall risk. And yeah, and it's more trouble for them. Yeah. Um, the, the, more active, the more active their clients or their patients are, the, the harder it is for them to keep track of them and all that stuff. Uh, to your point about strength, functional strength, and why I think truly strength training is so critical as we get older, to your sarcopenia point, but also, but other points, my mother-in-law, God bless her soul, she's passed away a couple of years ago, but she was very fit up until the very end. And the one thing I noticed was, as she was uh, getting sicker, was her lack of strength, that getting upstairs was a tr was trouble, that getting out of a chair into a chair was trouble to the what you were talking about. And that is a function of strength. Um, it, that has nothing to do with cardio or any of that. It's just, do you have that strength in your lower half, your trunk, to be able to do that? And right. as you said, once you can't, then it's a slippery yeah. slope. Yeah, it's it's sad. I, like, like you, I've seen it. saw it with my grandmother. I, I, I visited her in the nursing home almost every day for the last uh, three years of her life. And... No one was making making her get out of bed except me. Uh, the staff wasn't, um, and that was that was frustrating for me. But it was it was also a good thing. I got a chance to help help my granny, you yeah. know, when she needed me. So, um, but yeah, yeah, when you can't take care of yourself, we take that for granted. Getting off a toilet is something we take for granted, and uh, when you can't do it, you're in a lot of trouble really quickly. Yeah, everybody, nobody, t everybody takes their movement capacity for granted until they don't have it anymore. Right. And then they go, what the heck? But right. it generally doesn't happen overnight. It's a long, gradual decline, shall we say, where you're just less and less active and lose strength and balance and everything else. So right. very few people, short of having a serious accident, go from being very active to you know, not moving at all. So When somebody wants to start getting in shape, whether, again, power training, just build, getting stronger. What are some things that they should be thinking about, questions they should ask? Uh, maybe should they be doing this on their own in their basement by themselves? Should they hire a personal trainer? Uh, we're all, I'm sure we're both party kind of partial that, yeah, they should. <laughs> what, what questions should they ask that personal trainer before they hire them to come into their home? Uh, what, do you, what do you think about all this? Well, I think for I, yeah, to your point, obviously you and I are biased, so we would say yes. I find it interesting that people, you know, they have accountants to do their taxes, they have lawyers to handle all their legal stuff, yeah. but everybody DIYs it when it comes to their fitness. And my question would be, of those three things, which do you think is the most important? Yeah. And where a professional is going to really help you out. And by professional, I would say, first of all, you probably want a referral from somebody similar to you that's in a similar situation. Yeah. Um, if you get, you know, and I'm not saying anything about young trainers, but, you know, somebody that's relatively new, they simply may not have the experience to work with somebody older and right. um, may have some issues. Um, have they worked with people with similar circumstances to you, i.e., you know, you had a hip replacement or whatever the case, or a shoulder operation or whatever the case may be? And the other side, if you're active, are they familiar? You know, you play a lot of pickleball or you ski or whatever the case is. You like to do these things. Are they competent in those areas? Have they worked with people with similar interests? So I think experience is important with people similar to you because not all people are the same, obviously. And yeah. older people present interesting <laughs> challenges, shall we say. So yeah. do they have experience in working with older people? 
think that's that's a really good point. And uh, yeah, as we get older, we have mounting health problems. You know, maybe we're just not you know 90. We have heart disease, high blood pressure, maybe diabetes, in addition to things like you know dinopenia, sarcopenia, and stuff like that. Um, so we have to juggle all those things at the same time. Um, what I found interesting that you didn't say, and I think the per, maybe the personal trainers who may be listening to us, and I know we'd have, we have many listen to this podcast, one thing you didn't say is look for a specific fitness certification. There's yeah. a lot of these organizations out there that certify personal trainers. I think there's over 100 in the United oh, States. Yeah, yeah, and you're, you're probably on the shy side there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm conservative, yeah. no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, no, nobody cares uh, about that. And I think you've talked about it. Nobody, can, nobody asks right. you that. I mean, I've got clients mainly through referrals, um, you know, from – people that are similar situations, but also from people when I was working at the HealthPlex like you were years ago, mm -hmm. um, people would watch me train people and they go, oh, I want to do that. Right. And so that was how I, it wasn't because of my credentials and, you know, I am a very well credentialed, but that nobody ever has asked me <laughs> what my, what my certifications are. So, um, right. And, and especially in the general populations, right. I train a lot of athletes as well. So there it's maybe a little more important, like with golfers or baseball players or whatever the case may be. Yeah. But in the general population, nobody says, do you have that, you know, ACS, yeah. you know, whatever. They so, don't know the difference between the no. different certifications. So I'm glad you brought that up because I've, I've mentioned it before. I, I may have only had two people ever say, who are you certified by? And I'm, okay, I'll tell you. But, uh, you know, people who get emails from me, I, I don't mention any kind of letters behind my name anymore. There's no master degree behind my name. Um, it's just it's just me. And, and again, because the, the fitness industrial complex wants you to think that some organizations are better than others and you should pay a thousand dollars and, you know, a hundred dollars for our book and all that jazz. Go and get the books and study the books and then you got the knowledge. But right. don't, you know, don't go into credit card debt for some certification <laughs> uh, and, and, and unless maybe some job is, is requiring it. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. In certain parts of our field, like in yeah. the strength and conditioning world, in the collegiate uh, strength and condition and professional, like CSCS is, you know, pretty much a prerequisite. Um, yeah. But outside of that, um, yeah. Uh, I've now, no, I'm trying to think because I've worked in healthcare set, you know, I worked for a major healthcare system. I worked for Lifetime um, Fitness. Um, they're obviously, they're, they like to see your credential, but that's the hiring people, not the clients who are actually going to hire you. They don't go, oh, what, what are your, I'm not sure, what are your certifications? I'm not sure you're qualified. So right. they're, they're assuming that. Lifetime or whomever did the vetting of you and you're qualified for the job. Right. Yeah. And again, certification only matters. It only means you, you pass the minimum requirement to work safely with people. It doesn't mean we know everything. None of us know everything. No. So that's why, you know, that's why I often say qualified certified tra trainer, personal trainer is different than certified. Qualified is better than certified. Yeah. The only way you get qualified is keep learning. Yeah. Yeah. And there's people in our field that... Uh, like Louis Simmons, you know, the great powerlifting coach who had a high school education, but he certainly didn't have a college education, but he was self-taught right. and was considered one of the leaders. And his influence is still felt throughout our field, especially on the strength and conditioning side. Yeah. So, and then you do have people on the other side that are very well educated and qualified and are equally competent and good at teaching and all that. So, you know, it, it runs the gamut. Right. Um, so don't take something because you have somebody with all the credentials and doesn't know squat, no pun intended, <laughs> about, about training. They just, right. they, and the other thing is that interpersonal skills. One of my good friends in the industry is Mike Boyle, who's, you know, leading one of the best strength coaches in the world. Right. And he says when he's looking at interns, he looks at qualification. What's he call it? Uh, Gen GNP, genuinely nice people. He okay. says that's what I want in an intern. I can teach them the technical stuff. He says, but 
if they're not good folks, then it doesn't matter how right. much they know. Right. So, you got to have people skills. Uh, you, you that's that's the number one skill. Yeah. Right. Number one. Yep. Yeah. 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 Very cool. So, Very cool. Yeah. Um, when, when people are training to improve their strength, how, and, and if they are doing this with a, with a personal trainer, what, what do you think? One set, two sets, three sets? What do you, what do you think is better for these people? Well, I think it, again, it depends on, one of the things I started getting more towards is, um, gearing session length towards what I felt were the initial capabilities of the client in front of me. So I didn't get stuck on they had to be 60 minute sessions or whatever. So started doing uh, the shortest I would do was 30 minutes, but 30, 45 and 60 minute sessions and whatever. Some clients never get out of the 30 minute session and that's fine because if that's all they're capable of doing and we can get some work done in that 30 minutes, then by all means, let's do that as opposed to trying to do 45, 60 minutes and you're just standing around a lot because they're not capable of maintaining a certain pace or tempo or whatever, then it's not good for me in terms of um, wasting their time and money and it's not good for them for the same reason. So I think you got to gear the session towards the person and mm -hmm. there's certain components Again, this is my personal philosophy, as I talk about in my book, of what I think are good or necessary components of a training session. So first of all would be a combo like warm-up, a dynamic warm-up slash mobility work. Um, so those, I think, are necessary. Again, just kind of greasing the groove, if you will getting people lubed, getting them moving. And it's amazing when you start doing stuff. Like I had a client that we started doing, you know, marches and walks and skips and shuffles and all these things. And he goes, I was looking at the Eagles warm up on Sunday and they're doing the same stuff I'm doing. I'm going, okay, Mike, I think if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for us. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And then power training. So I like to do power training early in a workout uh, when the system, the nervous system is fresh. If you watch sprinters, um, they'll do hard stuff and then they rest for a good period of time. Now, people, we don't have enough time in a training session to rest like that, but the concept is there. Um, so power training and then strength training. And then... Uh, what I would call metabolic work, which is a fancy word for conditioning, fitness, whatever you want to call it at the mm -hmm. end. So those are what I feel are the major components of a yeah. good training session. And regardless of whether it's a half hour or an hour, if it's a half hour, then you're doing less volume, fewer sets. You know, you're just hitting those key points we talked about with the squatting the hip hinging the pushing the pulling etc you said uh, a lot a lot there uh i want to unpack maybe people have missed you you do power first then strength a lot right. of people can a lot of people think power and strength are the same thing no, but they're no, not no no right so strength is merely uh, without getting into you know there's all kinds of types of strength but when we're talking about strength training we're talking about the ability to exert force without regards to time or distance whereas power is strength or force times speed divided by distance how quickly you can exert a certain amount of force over a given distance like in a jump or sprinting or whatever um, and as we talked about for various reasons one of which primarily seems to be central nervous system related like we start to lose these neural connections as we get older, which leads to a loss of power. Uh, we lose power at almost twice the rate we lose strength. Mm -hmm. Strength and endurance are two qualities that we can maintain well into older age um, just because of the way we're, quote, wired. Whereas mm -hmm. power, if you don't train power, you start to lose it after six or seven days. So. Mm -hmm you have to train and if you haven't done it in a while 
and you've got some homework to do. So the, those are two different things. Um, and with power, it doesn't take a lot of time or, you know, if you're counting contacts or men, like we'll do two sets of eight medicine ball throws and maybe some low box work for lower body speed type stuff. That's it. And we're doing short sets, like 10 second sets for the lower body speed work, like right. quick, you know, go as fast as you can for those 10 seconds. And fast is relative. <laughs> so, so you're not going to move like, uh, you know, Mike Trout or, uh, you know, Barry Sanders. I mean, it's yeah. it's going to be your own thing. No, it, it, it's good you brought that up. The body responds amazingly well to even a little bit of physical activity. It doesn't take a lot. You don't have to spend two hours in the gym. I know bodybuilders don't spend two hours in the gym. Uh, and, and definitely don't do it when you're just starting out, but even a little bit of activity. And it's, a, it's good you mention that because we're, we're so much into the mindset of, oh, you got to do, you know, four sets of bench press and four sets of squats. And mm. not everybody needs to be doing that sort of stuff. No. So. And, and the other side of that is that, you know, for years, as you well know, most of the information we had in, from our you know, perspective as trainers, coaches was from bodybuilding stuff. And the thing we forget is that most of those people were, shall we say, enhanced, okay? And so the ridiculous volumes and the double splits they did and all this nonsense was because they were using their chemical friends to help them out. And that's not feasible for the rest of us who aren't going to do that and don't have that kind of time either. So... Um, yeah, so I think it's gotten better that people have become more educated or more stuff is out there um, that is more realistic in terms of, and again, you don't need, like you said, the key is consistency. That's the number one thing that will ensure you get results. There's no such thing as the world's perfect program. Consistency. You can take a crap program and do it regularly and you will get results. On the other hand, you can take the best program in the world and do it once every 10 days. And when I, why aren't I making any progress? I can't figure it out. Right. So, got to get in and be consistent. What do you think of going to failure? Because this is going to failure is something I hear a lot of uh, people in the gym talking about, personal trainers included. Mm -hmm. Do you always have to go to failure? Who shouldn't go to failure? Um, and what is going to failure? Uh, is, is it wise to do it with, with free weights and you don't have a spotter? <laughs> what do you think about that? Um, I think going to failure can have a place in a program. Yeah. I like to think that if you hear somebody say my way is the way and the only way, then I would get away from them as quickly as possible. Yeah. There is no one way. There's lots of ways, lots of tools, lots of methods, okay? And they all are effective, at least until the, you know, the body adapts and then you got to try something else. Right. So certainly training to failure um, is can be part of that. I think you have to be very, especially with older populations, have to be very aware of medical conditions. Um, so that might not be wise for people with, for example, deep vein thrombosis or something like that. <laughs> like, uh, no, probably don't want to do that. So I think you got to be aware of that. Um, but that's not to say it doesn't have a place. It just has to be used wisely and judiciously and with full awareness of what your client's uh, capabilities and medical history are. Yeah. So. It goes back to the old age. Personal training is personal, and you got to adapt the program to that individual. You can't give them a cookie cutter workout no. you know, that you that you do. You right. know, it may not be appropriate. Yeah. Um, no. It's uh, yeah. It's personalization, individualization of the program, you know, adapting the exercises to them as opposed to trying to force them to adapt to the exercises. Mm. So. What do you think is important for recovery after, after training? How should people be recuperating, recovering, whatever word you want to use, uh, after, their, after they work out? What's, what's going on with that? Well, as you well know, there's a mini industry. We're flooded with these 
things all the time. You know, this is the latest and greatest recovery tool or recovery drink or whatever. And I would say there's a three-legged stool of recovery that is paramount to recovery. And if you're not doing those three things, then don't waste your time and your money on the other stuff. And that would be sleep, nutrition, and hydration. And I think up until recently, the, the latter two, nutrition and hydration, I think a lot of people have understood for quite some time. But I think in this country, especially where we almost uh, pay, you know, bow down to people that so-called short sleepers, um, there's very few people that are like that. Less than 2% of the population worldwide are what are called short sleepers, people that can adequately recover with, you know, whatever it is, four or five hours of sleep on a consistent basis. The rest of us need our seven to eight or whatever it is. Um, and we don't even fully understand what happens when we sleep in terms of recovery. Um, but we know that it's essential to not only our physical well-being, but our mental sharpness and things like that. So if you're not sleeping well, then you got to get your act together and figure it out. You know, whether you got to do a sleep study or whatever the case may be, yeah. um, because you are fooling yourself. Uh, I mean, remember Bill Clinton thought he was a short sleeper and still he had, until he had several heart attacks. And then he discovered, hmm, I got to improve my eating and my, my sleep. Yeah, no kidding, Bill. Um, <laughs> so I think uh, people want all the gadgets, you know, the quick fixes, the magic pills and all this stuff. And that stuff is less than 5% of your recovery. Those first three are critical and if you don't have those in line then you're wasting your time and your money yeah you're right fitness industry fitness industry i think has shiny object syndrome you know whatever <laughs> it, it does whatever it was new energy drink or sleep right. supplement right. or you know even exercise gizmo there's a bunch of them out there oh yeah um, with yeah. a lot of shirtless salesmen who sell these things. <laughs> yeah, and they got that bill because of that device. Yeah, yeah right. I, yeah, cut yeah. me a break. <laughs> exactly, you're right. And jacked yeah. like that because they were using the magic bands, you know, whatever. <laughs> 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 uh, just get, P.T. Barnum's saying it was so true. Sucker born every minute, man. And they're selling it. That's for sure. I found that Lee Haney, you know, the great bodybuilder, whatever, eight-time Mr. Olympia, in regards to energy drinks, I found it interesting because when I was working at Lifetimes, the other st I was the oldest trainer on staff by 25, almost 30 years. Um, these p young people lived on energy drinks. Yes. And I was astounded at it. And Lee Haney said... I thought it summed it up so well. He said, that is borrowed energy that you are going to pay in terms of your sleep and other aspects of your recovery because that you can't sustain that without some consequences. And right. so I just thought, wow, he distilled it to it. You don't need all the exercise physiologists. You just need somebody with a little common sense. Um, so... Yeah, I think you do those types of things at your own peril. You have to be really cautious. Yeah, I agree. I'm glad you mentioned it. I, I I'm not a fan of energy drinks, and I and when I when I teach classes, I ask people who you know how many people are using energy drinks. Almost everybody. Mm. Like, Expensive mm -hmm. caffeine supplements and other enes, mm -hmm. agenamine and hordenine and all that mm -hmm. other zines, uh, which <laughs> I, I, I'm not convinced they do a lot. And when you take the caffeine out, they don't do anything. Oh, it has got arginine and yeah, big whoop de do. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, but whatever. Um. <laughs> well, just look at that latest controversy with that energy drink that was uh, popularized by those celebrities, one of the Paul brothers, I think, and the other. Uh, is that prime energy drink? I think, yeah, but they evidently, you know, con although you would think Congress has better things to do, they were going to investigate it because it was being promoted to kids and it had an inordinate amount of caffeine in it, like off the charts. And you just go, what is the long term effect of that? You know, these kids. It's on my list to review. It's been on my list for a while. Okay, I'll, I'll look forward to that because, yeah, yeah 
That's, I, I get yeah. lots of I get lots of emails and 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 messages. Oh, okay, look at this supplement. I have a list of things, and that's actually on it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I just uh, thought it was interesting that it made the mainstream news. That's the impact it was having because there were kids that were just like jonesing for this stuff. Um, wow. So, and you know, when you looked at the caffeine levels, you went, "Well, I'm no." scientists but <laughs> that doesn't appear to be healthy amount <laughs> right yeah exactly so. bruce you mentioned uh, a couple of times you have a book that is coming out tell me about this yeah so it's a project i've been working on for quite a while actually the title the working title now is ageless athleticism a template to an active life and uh i have the text done we're in the process of editing it um it's about 177 pages single spaced 12 font so it's pretty dense and various chapters in it you know kind of outlining my philosophy of training what is ageless athleticism which we talked about uh principles of training pillars of training and then talking about my assessment process. I'm big into assessment. I think we have to establish baselines where we are, whatever we're, our goals are, what are our baselines? Like what are our strength baselines, our fitness baselines, maybe body comp, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then various parts, the components of training, you know, strength training, power training. I have a chapter on sprinting. I'm big on sprinting. I think that is one of the fountains of youth. Um, and again, to our point earlier, why do people stop sprinting? Who says that you got to stop that at high school age? Or why? And running, picking up the tempo of your jogging uh, gait is not sprinting. Okay, there has to be 120 degree. I mean, I'm technically really into sprinting, so 120 degree separation between legs defines a sprint stride and most people just pick up their they're just doing this they're you know instead of going here now they're just going like this it's not a sprint stride and interestingly uh greg rose dr greg rose who's the founder of titleist performance institute co-founder golf you would think well what's golf and sprinting have to do with one another but when parents ask him what can their kid do to hit the ball further? He says sprint uh, because it's a total body contralateral power movement that applies to virtually everything else. So I'm, I have a whole chapter on sprinting, how to prep for it if you haven't done it in a while. And not everybody's going to sprint again. I get it. If you're in your 60s and you haven't sprinted in 40 years, it may not happen. I've been fortunate because I've been doing it all my life, so I still can do my version of sprinting. I understand I'm not as fast as I was, but I like I went out this morning and did a workout. Um, nice. I talk about metabolic training, some ideas on warming up, various types of warm-ups to do. Uh, recovery, again, more detail of what we just talked about. I have a chapter on nutrition. Um posture, all kinds of things. There's uh, 19 chapters. Um, and at the end, I end up with some stuff on trends where I, you know, some things that are just coming out and where I think that's going in terms of uh, things like blood flow restriction training. And um, I'm a big fan of eccentric training and flywheel training. Um mm -hmm. Where's that going? What do I think the uh, future holds for these things? And again, that's this is all one man's opinion. This is my philosophy. I don't right. believe I have the only way. I just believe it is a way. And I think it provides a template for people that are trying to aspire to do something more than just the routine stuff that's out there, especially for those of a certain age or even after you get you know mid 25 you know what mid 20s whatever uh, mm -hmm. not too much is geared towards people that age 
Yeah, no, I would, I would agree. Um, any, any idea when the book's coming out? I know, I, I know from experience, it's not, it's not easy to, to write a book and have it edited. And yes, <laughs> so I'm hoping by the end of October. That's our goal. Okay. Um, so we'll see. As you well know, deadlines and such get moved around, and sometimes life gets in the way and all that. So. Yeah. That's the goal. Again, this has been a project. I've had the, the gist of the book probably for a couple of years already, but then I start to go back in and I have new ideas. And I start editing <laughs> and you go, oh my God. Like this. So eventually I just got to go, this is it, done. There'll be a second edition or whatever. So yeah. to writing, it, writing is rewriting. As um, Yeah, yes. Yeah, no yeah. question. But it's been fun. Um, my clients have asked me to do something like this for years. And he said, you should put your ideas down. So anyway, hopefully by the end of October, that will come to fruition. Terrific. How can people find out when it's out? Is there a way to contact you? Do you have well, I would suggest I'll give you my email. That's the best way for people to contact me because I can add them to my constant contact email newsletter list. Okay. Um, so my email is B Kelly K E L L Y Limerick L I M is in Mary E R I C K at gmail dot com, and then you just say I'd like to be on your email, or even if you don't want to be on your contact list when the book comes out. So, right. and yeah. I'll uh, I'll put the email in the description so people can check it out and yeah. uh, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, you know, find out when your book comes out. I'm curious myself, so absolutely let me know. And uh, yes, uh, yeah, on. it's been uh, a long time. And <laughs> my wife says, "Get that damn thing done." <laughs> I, I understand. I've I've been there. It's uh, yeah. It's all I can say. <laughs> it's a challenge. Yes, it's not, it like, it's not like so many celebrities who write books, and it's a ghostwriter who write it. Uh, it. It's it's you writing the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's why I've had offers for people to you know write or you know do formatted email newsletters, which I've been doing for over ten years. You know, twice a week. That's a lot of content when you get down to it. Yeah. Um, and not to say that there hasn't been some redundancy, but I wanted it to be my voice. You know the way, and I felt that anybody else, it, it's not my voice; it's somebody else's, and I may or may not agree with the gist of the content. So, I agree. Yeah, yeah. So, That's when you do it yourself. Yep. Um, yep. This has been a lot of fun, Bruce. I really appreciate your time, and I'm going to link to your uh, email address in the description so people can check it out. Kind Great. of get on your list and find out when your book comes out. I'm curious myself. I'll join your newsletter list uh, and, and myself as well. But, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate your time, and uh, this has been a lot of fun. And for those who are watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast, if you need to get a hold of me, there's two ways to do it because I do everything the hard way myself. I have two websites, so joe-cannon.com uh, is one way, or you can get me through my other website, supplementclarity.com. And, uh, again, if you're on YouTube, I'm Joe Cannon one on YouTube, which you, if you're watching this, you know where I am on YouTube. So <laughs> anyway, I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty easy to find as well. So, um, yeah, until, uh, next, you know, same time, same bat channel. I'm Joe Cannon and, uh, thanks for listening and watching and, uh, talk to you next time.